Welcome to The Journey. My name is Jason Hatley. I'm the lead pastor here at The Journey Church in Boca Raton, Florida. And I want to thank you for joining me today as we continue our Success Secrets teaching series. And I want to say a very special welcome to those of you who call The Journey Boca Raton your home, but also a big shout out to everyone in New York who is joining us today for Church Online. I love it when we come together like this with all of our church for one big service. And so for those of you in New York City, Welcome to the service today. And we're going to be continuing this new teaching series that we've been in called Success Secrets. And in this series, we're looking into God's Word to discover what real success is, for the success from God's perspective, success from how God would define it, and then how we can have that kind of success in our lives. So if you haven't done so already, Click that blue button by the live stream player, download your message notes so you can follow along with me in the outline today. Now, today I want to talk with you about the secret skills for success. And you know, in this series, we've talked about how even though they're secrets, it's not secrets because God is keeping it from you. It's just secrets because the world has lost sight of these biblical truths, these biblical skills. And so today I want to show you these biblical skills that will lead to great success in your life. You know, the truth is, we all have skills, and some skills are really helpful and lead to success, and then, you know, some skills are, well, they're kind of useless. They don't lead to very much success at all. So just for fun, to begin our message today, I put together the top five list of useless skills that are probably not going to lead to success in your life. I want you to tell me if you know anybody with these skills. So number five is the skill of being able to annoy everyone. Do you know anybody like that? Hey, here, here's the deal. If you don't know anybody that can do that, it might be you that has that secret skill. Just saying, okay? So that's number five. And then uh, skill number four that is completely useless is the skill of folding a fitted sheet perfectly. I mean, who needs that skill? I mean, I can't do that. Can you do that? Who needs that skill? It seems useless to me. Uh, useless skill number three is the skill of making up a song for any situation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is starting to sound like a list of useless skills that I have in my life. So I'm getting a little worried about it, but I'm hoping we're going to turn it around here with skill number two. Useless skill number two is the skill of writing with both hands simultaneously. I mean, how do you even do that? I mean, can you do that? I mean, I guess you could be twice as productive, but you'll have twice as many spelling errors. I'm not sure how that works. And then the number one most useless skill is the skill of making up dumb top five list. So I guess I have that skill today. All right, so those skills may not be all that helpful, but for success in the modern world, you are going to need a skill set. And there's going to be skills like leadership and skills like sales or problem solving or communication or marketing or critical thinking or goal setting. Those are all skills that the world values for success. But what I'd like to share with you today is that there is another even more important set of skills, an ancient biblical set of skills that will guide you down the path of success that God will bless in your career, in your relationships, in your finances, in your legacy, in every area of your life. And it's those skills that I want to talk with you about today because here's the big idea of this series. God wants you to be successful, but God's definition of success is not the same as the world's definition of success. Because real success is not about wealth. It's not about uh, how much money you make. It's about doing God's will. That's the real definition of success, doing God's will. And today, I want to help you develop the skills that are going to allow you to do God's will. So let's go to the scriptures right now. Our first passage for today comes from Psalm chapter 33, verse 3. Let's read this verse aloud together. Are you ready? Go. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. Now, notice in this verse that David doesn't say, sing the same old, tired, lazy song that you've always sung because you never learned anything new. That's not what he says. No, he says to sing a new song. 
And, and if you want to be uh, successful in life, you're going to have to do some new things. You're going to have to learn some new skills to innovate and create, not just keep going through the motions. And then he says, play skillfully. In other words, be good at what you do. Really go after that. And then he says, sing with joy. And listen, I find that to be especially helpful if you're going to be successful. You want to find things that bring you joy. Now, why do we do that? Well, here's why. Because you're singing and playing and working and succeeding for the glory of God. Not for yourself, but for the glory of God. And God deserves our best. So the idea here is that as we live and work and move through life, God wants to grow us. He wants us to get better. He wants me to be a better parent. He wants me to be a better dad, a better husband. He wants us to get better as followers of Jesus, more skilled at the work that we do because all of those things bring glory to him and point other people to him. And here's what I believe. I believe that as Christians, we should be the most successful people in the workplace. Do you believe that? I believe that we too, we should because we have a greater reason to succeed than anyone else. But the key is in how God defines success not how the world defines success. And a great example of this is David from the Old Testament of the Bible. Now, most people know him as King David, but long before he was a king, long before he had those traits that the world would look at and say, oh, yes, he's very successful. Long before then, God looked at David's potential, and he called David to be king of Israel. Psalm 78 tells us something very, very important about what God sees and about what real success looks like. Take a look at Psalm 78, verses 70 through 72. He chose his servant David, calling him from the sheep pens. He took David from tending the ewes and lambs and made him the shepherd of Jacob's descendants, God's own people, Israel. He cared for them with a true heart and led them with skillful hands. So you see, God chose David not because of all of the worldly success he had already attained. He chose him because he saw the potential for him to be a skillful leader with a true heart. In fact, I want you to take your pen and underline that word, true heart. Underline that phrase. David's heart was true. David loved God, and even though he failed many times in his life, David's true heart always brought him right back to God. But then also underline skillful hands, because David didn't just have the right heart, he had the right skills. He led with skillful hands. Now, I want you to think for just a moment, what would have happened if David had only had one of those two? If he'd only had a true heart or skillful hands and not both? Well, if he had a true heart but not skillful hands, he would have had great intentions but he would have failed miserably because he would not have been able to do the things that God had called him to do. But then if he had had skillful hands but an evil heart, well, he may have succeeded by the world's standard, but in reality he would have failed because he would have lived for himself. He would have used people for selfish gain. He would have compromised his character. So you see, David needed both a true heart and skillful hands. And here's the truth. You and I need both of those as well. If we're going to be successful in life, we need a true heart and skillful hands. And today, I want to show you how to develop those secret skills that are going to lead to godly success in your life. These are skills that you're going to need, but most importantly, these are skills that God wants you to develop so that you can live the life he created you for. So let's jump into the message. Let's talk about the five secret skills for godly success. And here's the first skill. Write this down in your notes. It's the secret skill of industriousness. The secret skill of industriousness. This is the skill of hard work. And it's a skill that many people seem to have lost in our modern world. In fact, according to a recent Yahoo Finance article, it revealed that just 71% of young men held a full-time job in 2021, down from 85% in 1980. Now, let me just be careful to say, this is not just an issue for young men. This is an issue for many people, for those who are struggling with what to do after college in this labor market, or for those who feel aimless and are having trouble finding meaning and purpose in their work. And so that's why it's important for us to have a biblical view of work, to understand that God created work, 
and that God created us to work. It's part of our purpose in life. It's part of what brings meaning to our lives. And whether you work in finance or fashion, in retail or real estate, whether you work in entertainment or education uh, or you're in sales or you're a stay-at-home parent, this secret skill of industriousness is going to be one of the keys to real godly success in your life. I want to take you to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. And I want you to see the wisdom that Solomon writes about this topic. Here's what he says. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Don't you love the vivid imagery of that, of that passage? And I don't want you to miss the lesson here. Solomon is saying that we should learn from the industrious ant to work wiser, to work smarter, to work harder, to be more diligent in what we do. And when we do that, we will have what we need. Or, as a lot of people do, you can choose to follow the example of lazy people and spend your life doing just enough to get by, just enough to keep your job, just enough to not get fired, and then you will live with scarcity and poverty. Now, we've actually seen this ancient uh, proverb play out in our modern world in recent years. Are you familiar with the phrase or the term, quiet quitting? Yeah, it became a big deal in the workplace over the last few years where employees did not actually quit their jobs, but they just decided they were going to put in the minimal effort required. They were going to do just enough to get through the day, just enough to not get fired. Now, that's not a very successful path or purpose in living. And there's a lot of different reasons for why this quiet quitting became such a a, a big deal. But the main reason, it seems, is a lack of joy and meaning in work. So how do you find joy and meaning in your work? How do you find passion and purpose? Well, our memory verse from Colossians 3.23 tells us how. Let's read this passage aloud together. Are you ready? Go. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Listen, that's the key to industrious, meaningful, passionate work to work at whatever you do as though you were working for God, to do the work before you for the glory of God, to work as if God is your boss, to represent Jesus well in the marketplace. And listen, when you do, you will find joy and meaning and purpose in the work you do, whatever that work may be. So industriousness, that's the first secret skill of success. And the next skill is closely related. Skill number two, back in your notes, is the secret skill of excellence. The secret skill of excellence. Well, what is excellence? Excellence is doing the best you can with what God has given you. Let me say that again. Excellence is doing the best you can with what God has given you. So it's not comparing yourself to other people and saying, oh, I'm better than them, or, oh, I'm not as good as them. No, it's looking at the skills and time and talents and opportunities that God has given you and saying, God, I'm going to take what you've given me, and I'm going to use this for your glory. I'm going to do the best I can with what you have given me. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, Solomon writes about this when he says this, whatever you do, do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. Now, if you have your pen handy, underline that phrase, whatever you do, do well. That's a great lesson for life. Whereas my dad used to say, son, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. That's a good lesson for life. So this secret skill of excellence is about bringing your best. And I want to ask you today, are you bringing your best in every area of your life right now? Are you bringing your best at your job? Are you bringing your best to your marriage or to your relationship with your kids? Many people don't. Many people are looking for the easy way, not the excellent way. And listen, maybe that's you. Maybe you say, well, Jason, 
Uh, why should I strive and work so hard at what I do? It's not even what I want to be doing. And maybe you went to school for fashion or accounting, but you're stuck working at a job at a restaurant because you can't get a job in your field. And so you're thinking, well, I'm just going to do the minimum here. Uh, I'm not going to bust it to be uh, really excellent at this restaurant job. It's not what I want to do. Whenever I get the real job I want, then I'll do my best. But can I tell you a secret? You're not going to get the job you want if you don't do the job you have with excellence. This is the secret skill of excellence. So decide today that whatever you put your mind or your hands to, you're going to do it to the best of your ability for the glory of God. And then let me challenge you to keep growing and and to keep developing. You know, excellence is not just about where you are. It's about where you could be. It's about who you are going to be. And one of the reasons that you might not be where you want to be in your life is because you stopped growing. You stopped doing the things that you needed to do to become the person that you want to become. And maybe you're blaming other people for your lack of opportunity or your lack of progress. And you think somebody is out to get you or you feel like you've been unfairly passed over. But it could just be that you've lost the hunger to grow and develop and be excellent at whatever you do. But listen, if you will develop this skill of excellence and manage well the opportunity that God has given you today... The scripture tells us that God will give you more opportunities. And when he does, this next secret skill is the key to managing those more opportunities better. Let's go to secret skill number three. Here it is. Write it down. The secret skill of cultivating my inner life. The secret skill of cultivating my inner life. Now, our culture defines success by what it sees on the outside by wealth, by clothes, by car, by home. The appearance of success is what matters to this world. But real success is about what happens on the inside. It's about who you are becoming. In fact, nothing will have a greater impact on the success in every area of your life than this secret skill of developing this inner life. You will never be greater in public than you are in private. So what is the inner life? Well, simply spoken, the inner life is who you are becoming in Christ. It's who you are becoming in Christ. It's those daily decisions that you make to become like Jesus that are going to impact your success and also how you handle adversity. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Listen, to experience, success, uh, to experience success and to manage that success well, our spirits need to be renewed every day. Now, a lot of success books will tell you that the way you cultivate this inner life and you renew your spirit is you meditate on your daily goals or you just speak positive affirmations. And let me just say, God is all for setting goals, and the truth is we could all stand to be more positive in how we think and talk to ourselves, but that's not really what this is about. Instead, it's about focusing on God and what God wants, not on me and what I want. It's about uh, becoming more like Jesus in how we think and how we act and how we react. It's about reading your Bible. It's about praying daily. It's about being in church each weekend. It's about being in a growth group and becoming more of who God has created you to be. It's about asking God to point out areas in your life where you may need to surrender or confess or to be strengthened. It's about finding your identity in who God says you are rather than who the world says that you are. Because listen, the greatest gift that you have to give to the people around you, to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, to your career, the greatest gift that you have to give is who you are becoming in Jesus Christ. That is the greatest gift you can give. And maybe you've heard the old saying that says, show me your habits and I'll show you your future. Let me ask you today, what do your spiritual habits say about where you are and where you're going? What do those spiritual habits say about you? Because listen, if there is only one skill that you develop today out of all of these skills I want to share with you, let it be this one. Because you were created to become more 
like Christ. That's what Peter is telling us in 2 Peter 3.18 when he writes, You must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to him both now and forever. Amen. So, develop the secret skills of industriousness, of excellence, of the inner life. And then the next skill to develop, number four back in your notes is, the secret skill of godly time management. The secret skill of godly time management. Your time is your life because there's nothing more valuable than time. You can always get more money, but you can never get more time. It is a truly unrenewable resource. So to succeed in life, you're going to need to develop this secret skill of godly time management, to learn to see time from God's perspective. You know, there are 1,440 minutes in every day, okay? 1,440 minutes in every day. And we all get the same number of minutes. Nobody gets more than the rest of us. But not everybody gets the same value from those minutes. Not everybody gets the same value from their day because you get to choose what you will do with those minutes. Will you waste them or will you invest them wisely? And unfortunately, in our culture, most people waste those precious moments every day. They live distracted lives, distracted by their phones, distracted by entertainment or TikTok or busyness, unclear about what really matters most. All the while, those precious moments of life pass them by. Is that happening to you right now? Are you letting the precious moments of your life pass you by, moments that you will never get back. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, it shows us how to start thinking about time from God's perspective. Let's read this powerful passage aloud together. Are you ready? Go. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. The psalm tells us that life is brief. Life is fragile. We're all going to die. We just don't know when. So how we spend our time really matters. We want to be wise with our time. And here's what I know. You cannot say yes to everything. To say yes to one thing is to say no to a hundred different things. No matter how hard you try, you cannot do everything. Now, there is one thing you can always do. You always have enough time to do God's will. And that's what real success is, doing God's will. But you can't do everything in life. You're going to have to discern what is best and say no to the rest. You're going to have to learn to set some priorities and determine what matters most. So to help you with that, I want to give you a powerful exercise right now. It's based on Psalm 90, the the passage that we just read. And I want you to answer these three questions. And I believe that if you can answer these three questions, it's going to help you develop a godly perspective on time management. Using Psalm 90, here's the first question. What would you do if you discovered you only had 90 days to live? Okay, so it's Psalm 90, so we're going with 90 here. What would you do if you only had 90 days to live? What choices would you make? What things would you cut out of your life? What would you spend more time doing? What would you invest your life in? I want you to think about that for just a moment. What would you do if you only had 90 days to live? Now, let's go to question number two, a little more intense here. What would you do if you discovered you had 90 minutes to live? If you knew that 90 minutes from now, your time on earth would come to an end, what would you do? Who would you call? Who would you want to be around you? What would you ask for? How would your answers change from having 90 days now to having 90 minutes. Now here's the third and perhaps the most important question. What would you do if you only had 90 seconds to live? If you knew that sudden doom was waiting for you 90 seconds away, what would you care about? What would you ask for? What would you focus on? What would you desire? That's a very clarifying experiment, isn't it? Here's my question to you. Wouldn't it be wise to live every day of our lives as if that day were the last day? To use our time for the things that really do matter most and invest in things that have eternal value. 
That is godly time management. That is a skill that you and I are going to need if we are going to be truly successful, to get clear about what matters most, to make the most of the time that we have and live the lives that God has given us to the fullest. You see, God wants you to succeed. And to do so, you're going to need the skill of industriousness and the skill of excellence and the skill of cultivating the inner life and the skill of godly time management. But there is one more skill that you're going to need, and it's skill number five in your notes. Write this down. That's the secret skill of building God's kingdom. The secret skill of building God's kingdom. You know, oftentimes we measure success on earth by what we build on earth. Building wealth or building a home or building a business or a monument or buildings. But this is the secret skill of building something that will last long after all of those things have fallen. It's the skill of building things that will last forever. And the only thing that will last forever and make an eternal difference is God's kingdom. Now, what is God's kingdom? Well, it's not a physical kingdom or place or palace. You see, the kingdom of God is displayed by God's people who are living out God's will through God's church in our world. And uh, God's kingdom expands as we tell other people about Jesus, and they come into God's kingdom as well. In fact, Jesus said that we should pray for God's kingdom to come on earth when he taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.10. Notice what Jesus says. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says that we should pray for this broken world to be transformed, for lives to be changed, for the lost to be found, for people to be saved. That is our mission. And if you have breath in your lungs today, you are alive because God has a mission for your life. And God's mission for your life is to help build his kingdom. That's why we're here. Because the kingdom, the kingdom of God is not just about you and I going to heaven. It's about us helping as many other people go to heaven with us as possible. It's about using the skills and the abilities and the talents and the money and the influence and the opportunities that God has given us to help as many other people come into God's kingdom too. So how do we build God's kingdom? Let me give you a few practical ways that we do that. First of all, we do that by working to make this world a better place, by serving others and meeting needs around us. That's one of the important ways that we build God's kingdom. And then we also build God's kingdom by inviting other people into the kingdom, by praying for our friends and family members who don't know Jesus, by inviting them to church, by telling them about what God has done in our lives so that they can experience the saving power of Jesus in their lives too. And by the way, we have a great opportunity to do this coming up in just two weeks at the kickoff of our God on Film teaching series. You know, every year at The Journey in both New York and Boca, uh, this is the series where we see the most first-time guests come, and oftentimes the series where we see the most people put their faith in Jesus. We have a great opportunity. I hope that you'll invite your friends to the kickoff of God on Film. It could be a day that changes their lives forever, a day that they step into God's kingdom. That's an important way that we build God's kingdom. Now then, we also build God's kingdom by investing our resources in kingdom initiatives. You know, the truth is God has blessed us with all that we have. And he gives us those things so that it will meet our needs, but he also gives it to us so that it can expand his kingdom here on earth. Look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. He says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So Jesus says, listen, don't waste all of your wealth, all of your money on this world. Those things, they're fine. They're, there's nothing, nothing necessarily wrong with them sometimes, but those things aren't going to last. So he says, instead, invest some of what God has blessed you with in kingdom initiatives that are going to help other people go to heaven, that are going to bring God's kingdom on earth. So we in, invest in our church. We invest in missions. We invest in helping to show Jesus' love. And that's why God gave us the resources that we have so we could help build his kingdom. So Jesus says, invest as much as you can back into God's kingdom because when you do, you're building something of eternal value. Now, one of the ways that we do that 
is through tithing, when we give our tithes and offerings here at The Journey each week. Now listen, that's how life-changing ministry happens at our church. And can I just say, what an amazing uh, season of ministry that we've been in as a church. Not too long ago, we celebrated our biggest Easter ever. Uh, It was one of the most amazing Easter's that we've ever had. And Between our New York and Boca campuses, about 50 people became followers of Jesus just on that one day, just on Easter Sunday. That's building the kingdom of God. And then through our community ministry partnerships, we've helped feed thousands of people here in South Florida and in New York City. That's helping to build God's kingdom. And then our kids and student ministry is thriving, helping our children come into God's kingdom. That is an important part of building God's kingdom. You know, lives are changing every week here at The Journey. And when you give, you have a hand in that. Because none of that life-changing ministry is possible without your generosity in giving. And then, you know, here in Boca, we are, uh, many in our church are giving above and beyond their tithes to our Celebrate Baptism project. They're giving in faith today to build the baptistry where we're going to see hundreds or even thousands of people baptized in the years to come. And then in New York City, Many are giving above and beyond their tithes to the next initiative to secure a future home and the future and the security of our church there in New York City so that we can have a long-term impact there. Listen, that's a big part of building God's kingdom, using what God has given us to invest in helping other people go to heaven. And listen, if you're not serving others in Jesus' name, if you're not inviting people to come to know Jesus, if you're not allocating some of the resources God has blessed you with to build his kingdom, then you are not truly succeeding. You're not. Not in God's eyes. You are not truly succeeding. Now today we've talked about the secret skills of success and how knowing them is going to lead to greater success for you and greater impact in our world. And I do want to leave you with one final thought today. You know how the world measures success by what you get? Who has the most money and wealth and fame and followers? Who has the most prestigious job? That's how the world measures success. But at the end of your life, none of that is going to matter. None of it is going to matter. No one is going to remember how much you made. They're going to remember how much you gave. They're going to remember how much you gave, what you poured your life into. Jesus says that measuring success by money And power and fame is an empty pursuit. Not only will it leave you disappointed, but you could lose your soul in the process. Let's look at our final passage today from Matthew chapter 16, verse 10. It's the words of Jesus. Let's read them aloud together. Are you ready? Go. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Listen, you were created for more than the success this world has to offer. You were created to spend eternity with the God of the universe, the God who made you, who formed you, who loves you, whose son Jesus died for you. And if you have never trusted Jesus to give you the eternal reward, that's true success. And that's the kind of success that only God can give you when you put your faith in Jesus. And I want to invite you to do that right now as we pray. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you that when we were lost and broken and separated from you because of our sin, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Father, forgive us for when we get enamored with the success of the world. Help us not to fall into that trap. That trap. Help us to pursue true success by honoring you, by becoming more like Jesus, by using our time wisely and by generously building your kingdom. And then for those of you who are here today who have never found the ultimate success, the success that comes only from giving your life to Jesus and knowing that you've been made right with God, that you have purpose for living and that you have a home in heaven. If you've never done that, you can do that right now. Just pray this prayer with me quietly in your heart. Just pray, God, today for the first time, I turn from pursuing the world's definition of success and I pursue you. I put my faith in Jesus. I believe that he is the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins and that he rose again so that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. I know that I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. So Jesus, I invite you to come into my life to forgive me of all of my sins. I don't want to live apart from you anymore. I want to follow you from this day forward in the fellowship of your church. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen.